Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. This is ADHD Experts from Attitude Magazine. I'm Susan Coffin for Attitude. One of the aspects of parenting children with attention deficit disorder and learning differences that we address constantly and frequently at Attitude is school learning and academic success. Our guest today is Ann Dolan, and her topic is ADHD and Executive Functions, Tips, Tools, and Solutions for Academic Success. Ann has just a vast experience, over 20 years of experience, tutoring, teaching, and consulting with students with ADHD and learning disabilities via her company. It's called Educational Connections, and I think it's in the Washington, D.C. area. Is that correct? That's correct. And her specialty, and the specialty of her organization, which is a large one, is organization skills, long-term planning, and studying effectively. So among the topics she'll address today are motivation, organization, of course, and procrastination, which she's just been telling me about, which there's a great deal of um, interesting new research. Let me mention that she has a wonderful website that you can find at ectutoring.com. There are free ebooks on a variety of topics. She writes a daily blog, and most recently on procrastination, and offers just a lot of helpful information. So, and thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, Susan. It's great to be here today and talk to all the parents out there. You know, it's interesting. Um, I was a classroom teacher for six years, and when um, when I first started teaching, I um, actually started tutoring as well. And I quickly realized that actually my calling wasn't a classroom of 30 students, but it was working with kids one-on-one. -on -one. And I, I saw a huge difference in the students that I tutored, not only in their academic ability, but also their confidence. And what I learned along the way um, during those six years was that many students I worked with were very capable. They were very bright. There was nothing wrong with their intelligence. But the problem was more that they had a hard time being organized and they had really a tough time with planning long-term assignments. Um, and often they did not know how to study effectively. And these were all skills that weren't really taught in their classroom. So who could blame them? And um, I found that when I worked with them specifically in these areas that their academic ability, their grades also improved. And so today I'm going to share with you some of those um, things I learned along the way, and these are also things that our tutors do now with uh, many of the students we work with through my company, Educational Connections. About 20% um, of our business is called educational coaching, and it's specifically helping students with those three areas, organization, time management, and study skills. So let's get started on the next slide. As I mentioned, there is certainly a divide between what kids are capable of doing and actually what they produce. And if you think of the American classroom, it's very much production-based. It's very much finish this worksheet, write this essay. And the completion task is what our kids are not always good at, even though they have the knowledge. So we see this disconnect between what they can do and then actually what they produce. So let's talk a little bit about some top tips and start with the area of organization on our next slide. You know, so often kids have trouble with paper flow and I've seen kids with, um, especially as they get older, with seven different binders and they have a hard time managing such a multitude of binders. I actually um, taught a study skills class at a local school and the school was actually um, under-enrolled, so they had more lockers than students. And one of the students I worked with was actually using six lockers. So it's not uncommon for kids to be trying to juggle many different binders, um, to have things in many different places. And what I've found with middle and high school kids is if they can consolidate binders and use fewer binders, that's better. For younger students, elementary school students, they often will do better with a binder that has a built-in accordion folder. Often our kids are not good at hole punching and filing. Um, so as simple as we can make it for our kids, the better. Also, binders, um, whether you have one or a few, you, students should have one dedicated homework folder. And there was a great research study done with middle school boys with ADHD 
um, with ADHD. And the researchers found that when these students had one dedicated homework folder, the completion rate increased for homework and their grades improved. So that means, you know, whether your student um, has homework in algebra and English and science, the homework that he gets should go on the left side of this homework folder. It should be labeled to do or homework. And when he gets done with it at night, again, no matter what subject it is, it goes on the right-hand side, completed work. That way, when he goes to school the next day, he always knows where his homework is. Um, a clean sweep is also super helpful. You know, we can, even if as parents we're really organized, it doesn't matter. Our kids don't absorb um, our organizational habits all the time. So it's often helpful to schedule something that's called a clean sweep. And this is 20 minutes once a week when you turn up the music super loud in your house and it's a time where everybody drops everything and gets organized. So it's a time for parents where we clean out the junk drawer, maybe we organize our bills. And kids clean out their binder, put, make sure their papers are in the right place. Kids need that type of maintenance. And the other thing that often helps, and again, this should be programmed in your phone, and if your child has a phone, this type of archiving should be an appointment as well, is um, called archiving. Um, and as you can see in the slide, this is an expandable Pendaflex hanging file folder, which you can buy on Amazon. And I often like kids to try to color code as much as they can. So for example, if your child has a binder with an accordion folder and say math has a blue tab, then on his hanging file folder, you see at the top, that blue folder should be labeled math. So about once a month, your student should be going through his binder and taking out important old papers that he doesn't necessarily need to still keep there. Those would be old tests and quizzes because he may not may need them later on. It really helps kids that tend to, you know, keep papers for too long. I've worked with kids that um, in May they still have papers from October in their binder. Let's also talk about some other things we can do as parents. You know, a real simple solution is to have what's called a launching pad. And a launching pad is really a bin or it could be an old dish pan. It could be really anything. Um, but you put this container by the door in which your child exits each morning for school. And the idea is the night before when your child's done with homework, and by the way, I tell kids, your homework's not done until it's in your homework folder, in your binder, and your binder's in your backpack, your backpack's in your launching pad. Everything that needs to go to school the next day should be in the launching pad the night before. That would be backpack, maybe lacrosse stick for after school practice. Maybe if your child can't find his shoes in the morning, shoes go there. Library books. So in the morning, you know, instead of rushing around and being very hectic, your child simply gets his things out of the launching pad and in essence he launches into his day in an organized fashion. It's certainly a lot less stressful. Other parents have found that little reminders on the door um, often help kids. So for example, if they if it's um, you know Monday and Friday are library day and your student needs to bring a library book, often parents will write library book on um, the checklist or they might write a note, remember to bring your lunch, something like that. The problem with those posted reminders is, is they get old after a while. So one idea I heard about actually at the last CHAD conference was to sparkleize them because they kind of disappear. If you have the same reminder up day after day, it kind of blends in with the paint on the wall. So a good idea is to rewrite it on a new piece of paper with a different colored ink or maybe a different colored paper to sparkleize it, to make it interesting once again. Photographs on our next slide can also help. You know, some one of the difficulties kids have is that they can't visualize what organization looks like. So, for example, you say, go clean your room. Um, you may go up 15 minutes later and your child is playing with Legos. Or your child may have cleaned her room, but it's not what you would call clean. So same thing with the desk at school. Often kids have a hard time maintaining neatness. But if you simply take a picture or ask the teacher to do this of the desk in the organized fashion um, when it's neat, and you cut that picture out and paste it on the inside of the desk, kind of like where you see that pencil right there, kids now have a frame of reference. They can look at that picture and say, okay, this is what organization looks like. Um, simple things like having textbooks on the left side and soft cover things on the right side. In this case, it's textbooks on the left and pencils, tape, glue sticks, all those things on the right. A picture can be very powerful. 
I had I was actually doing a workshop at a school um, a, a few weeks ago, and this parent um, sent me an email afterward, and I was actually talking about clean rooms during this workshop, and I mentioned that you know pictures can be very powerful. You want to take a picture of your child's room when it's in a generally clean. Um, when it's generally clean and take it from two different angles and post it on your child's dresser with three bullet points underneath stating what a clean room is. And for example, in my son's room, I have two boys, 16 and 11. My younger son struggles with this. So his goals are nothing on the floor. The cups have to be brought downstairs into the sink because he often brings Gatorade bottles and cups in his room. And your laundry must be in a basket. So those three things constitute a clean room. And this mom sent me the e an email. Here's what she said. She said, I decided during your presentation to lower my expectations about a clean room. To be honest, I didn't think they were very high. Change bed sheets on Sunday, clean off surfaces and dust, put clean clothes away, pick up everything on the floor, put dirty laundry, dirty clothes in the laundry chute, and take toys to the basement. I talked to my 13-year-old last night, and now we have floor is clear, food and drinks returned to kitchen, and laundry out of sight. And she sent me a picture of what um, the child's clean room looked like now. And she said, my, my child was so happy because for the first time, he felt like things were actually doable. All right, let's talk a little bit about distraction because this is often a big issue when it comes to homework and studying. You know, as we know that there are two types of distractible kids. Some kids are the fidgety type and some kids tend to be more of daydreamers. For the fidgety kids, and these are kids that often, you know, um, they can kind of drive us crazy during homework. These are the kids that will walk back and forth in their chair. They'll um, twirl their hair, chew on their sleeve, click their mechanical pencil thousands of times. And it's almost like they have to be doing something when they're studying or doing their homework. And as parents, it's, and educators, teachers too, it's our first and natural instinct to say, stop doing that, put that down. But actually research shows that when kids have something to touch because they're actually craving that sensory stimulus, stimulation that actually helps to, them to be more focused, they need that. They need that tactile um, feeling, that touch. And so often a fidget toy is just the key. This is an example of uh, a Tangle Junior, which is research-based. A study was done, again, with why do we always study boys? I don't know, we do. With um, fifth grade boys with ADHD doing a math problem solving worksheet, and the study found that the kids that had the fidget toy and they used it in their non-writing, they played with it in their non-writing hand, they were actually more accurate, they got more problems right, and they spent more time on task um, than the other group that didn't have a fidget toy. Things like finish your spelling, then take a break, and then start your math often work better than expecting your child to do spelling and math all along the same, um, within the same time frame. Even little things like chewing gum also help. Um, Sharon Weiss, who's an expert in the field, um, often asks kids, how many reminders will you need? So if you're the parent that always, you always find yourself going back and redirecting your child to get them on task and you feel like you're always nagging, and, you know, it sometimes it's the point where it's dozens of times. You may want to say to your child, how many reminders do you think you might need um, to get back on task? Often kids will just say a couple and try to stick to that. So you'd say, this is your first reminder. Oh, and this is your second and last reminder. A field that I'm super interested in is called um, is procrastination. And in fact, we're having a webinar if you're interested it's, um, you can find information on it. It's called The New Science Behind Procrastination. It's on February 13th, and you can register on my website, which is Ann Dolan, A-N-N-D-O-L-I-N.com, and at the top you'll see a tab called Presentations. Um, but it's interesting because we used to think that, oh, wow, these people just have time management issues that can't procrastinate, but now... Um, a lot of new science is saying that it's actually an issue with mood repair, that people, um, you know, when you have the choice of should I upload this picture to Instagram and check all my Instagram posts or should I do my math homework, you know, especially people with poor executive functioning skills are always going to pick the Instagram. Um, and part of it is that we don't know when we're in that mood repair mode. And we do that because that Instagram helps us to feel better. 
And subconsciously, we feel that in, we must actually be in a good mood in order to start homework. And that's really not true. So often the first step is to first realize that you are in that mood repair mode. Um, and then the next step is to lower the barrier of entry. You know, oftentimes we'll say to kids, oh, you need to start your homework. But sometimes it's actually more productive if at first we have to do this for our kids, but eventually they learn on their own, is just to say, okay, I'm going to put five minutes on the timer. Um, I call this the toler. you could do it in ten minutes, tolerable ten, or even five minutes, five minutes of fury. Work as hard as you can and focus as best you can just for five minutes, and then you can take a break or you can keep on going. Breaking things down into little snippets really helps kids. Our next slide is about study skills. And actually, there's some really interesting research about study skills. We know that um, things that we used to think worked really well with kids aren't as effective. If we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. The, what we know is that oftentimes kids with, um, all kids actually, study by rereading. In fact, a recent statistic found that 84% of students study by rereading. That means they'll go back and they'll read the chapter in their book. They'll read their notes. And this is highly ineffective. It's too great of a visual load. And kids don't actually remember that way. But they think they do. They know really no other way. Um, so we do know that there are actually three things that have a major impact on test performance. And, and they're not rereading. One is called distributed practice. And this kind of makes sense. And it kind of goes along with the procrastination thing, too. You know, many times, for example, if the student has a test on Friday, they'll study on Thursday night very late, sometimes between 9 and 10. And they think that they've done a good job by studying, um, even though it may have been very stressful in the family because as a parent, you may have you know, been on their case about starting. But the, the research shows that actually that type of cramming is not effective. Um, kids that procrastinate and cram actually have lower grade point averages and a higher stress level. So research shows that if you take that one hour on Thursday night and you distribute it into 15 minutes, four nights before the test, 15 minutes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, your child will actually get a higher grade on the test on Friday than that, that one time um, the night before. The reason is not maybe not what you expect. Certainly it's because you're reviewing the material multiple times, but it's also because sleep. And we know that sleep actually lays down learning. It cements learning, and it's very powerful in the learning process. So the more you study and then sleep on it, you're going to dream about that. Even though you may not know you're dreaming about it, your brain will rehash and recycle that information. We also know that practice tests are highly beneficial. Um, and that means that I work with kids all the time, and our tutors do as well. Um, you want to try to predict what your teacher might have on the test, and then make yourself a few questions similar to what might be on the test. That way you're studying not just what you know, which is what kids often do, but also what you don't know. And also there's research on um, a topic called elaborative rehearsal. And that means you have to study different ways. Um, an example is I had this student, and um, she was really funny. She was a seventh grader, and she was learning to solve for X. And um, she came to me. I, this was a few years ago. I tutored her, and she said, I don't know why I did so badly on, the, on this test. I studied, and I studied, and I studied. And I said, well, show me how you studied. And she showed me all these problems that she worked on, and there were things like 2X equals 10, 5P equals 15. The problem was when she went to take the test, the teacher had things like um, 10 equals 5P. And now all of a sudden the variable was on the other side and she couldn't do it. She really hadn't learned the material. But sometimes kids don't study in different ways. They just memorize and that is never good. And lastly, the time at which you study and review that material one more time is important. So if your child has a test on Friday, they study a few minutes each day. Then on Thursday night, if they review that just one more time right before they go to bed, that time is important because, again, they're going to rehash that information even more when they sleep. So let's wrap up with talking about distractions from the media. This is um, a question I get from parents all the time. Here's what we know. We know that um, TV is never a good thing, and they're really – kids should just not have the TV on in the background that's easy to control. Music is a little bit harder to control. We know that it's actually fine for 
um, things that are rote. So for example, during that clean sweep time, you turn on the music really loud, it kind of pumps you up, gets energy going, you're going to get organized. It's fine if you're, you had a handwritten essay and you're retyping the essay. It's fine if the assignment is write your spelling words three times each. That's, there's not a lot of thought going into those tasks. But it is not productive when your student um, has to learn and retain new information. So music in the background when you're studying is not effective. Uh, research shows that you're actually going to do better on the test if you don't have music in the background regardless of the type of music. Um, also, many parents say that their child is really influenced by, you know, their phone. I had a parent the other day say, I think it's like another appendage on my child. And she said, it's really hard to get it away from my child during homework. Um, often, you know, taking the phone away completely can create a lot of battles. But for some families, that's key because their child just ha doesn't have enough self-control. But for other families, um, having a routine where maybe the phone is in another room, um, the child will study for 20 minutes or work on homework and then take what's called a tech break. Then they can go check their Instagram, send a text, whatever, for a minute, and then go back to their homework for 20 minutes. But often, kids need that routine um, because they're just too distractible with their phone by their side too much. And there is something really interesting. This guy at Stanford who did the research on the tech break uh, coined the this term called FOMO, fear of missing out. And he said a lot of our kids these days have it. They want to know, oh my gosh, how many people liked my Snapchat picture? Or how many people liked my Facebook post? Or who's following my Twitter feed? And they're really interested in what other people think. And they're afraid also that they're going to miss out on something really important. And he did some research to show that actually when kids don't have their phone at all, it can increase anxiety in some students, which decreases working memory. And then lastly, because now so many kids have books that are web-based, that are um, online, it's hard for them to manage distractions. Um, you know, I've worked with kids that will have their Facebook page open, they'll be, have YouTube videos, um, they'll have all these things going on in the background, and they'll have their social studies book open as well. And what we know is that the more windows you have open at the bottom of your screen, the more distractible you are, which obviously makes sense. But what's also interesting is the more windows you have open, the, less, the lower your GPA is likely to be, which I think is unbelievably powerful. So if we can encourage our kids just to maybe have a couple of windows open, just what they're working on, that's really beneficial to kids to help them keep focus. And for those students who are often distractible, they should absolutely have their computer or their laptop in a public place where you can oversee it. Let's take some questions. Um, who has a question about some of the things that we talked about? Um, and this has just really been great. I've got lots of questions to give you about homework, so maybe we'll mm -hmm. stay on that for a minute. Sure. But before we do, I just want to ask you about the gender disparity. Mm -hmm. Virtually. We mentioned this before we started. Virtually 95% of the questions I have in front of me um, are about uh, boys. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an, any insights into whether boys have have different, more difficulty with homework and organization than girls with inattentive ADHD? Mm -hmm. Or any thoughts I, on that gender yeah, absolutely. disparity? Most definitely. It was, it's interesting, Susan, because um, we were reviewing some of the statistics for my company, and we do... Um, a lot of educational coaching tutoring, um, and a lot of subject tutoring too, but we looked at the breakdown between boys and girls, and it's about 60% boys and 40% girls. And okay. I would say just, you know, from experience and working with a lot of kids, and as you know, boys tend to be the more fidgety types, where girls are the more deep daydreamers, so they kind mm -hmm. of fly under the radar more. Um, I am the parent of two boys, one of whom has ADHD and the other does not. But um, in general, I would say that boys really need to have multiple places to do homework. There is some research that suggests that actually doing homework in the same place every day, day in and day out, is not really that productive. So your son, even your girl, should have maybe three places that are generally clutter and distraction free to do homework. Because it's likely that maybe Monday they do it in the home office, Tuesday it's in the dining room. Kids need to move. 
And we also can't ex expect our boys to sit for an extended period of time. These are often kids that do better, you know, in the kitchen, standing up, doing homework at the kitchen counter, which is higher than sitting at a desk. Um, boys in general, when it comes to the classroom, they like a coach-like type of teacher. So they can tolerate a booming voice. They like louder voices, whereas girls can become anxious. So sometimes the way we address our boys and girls as parents has to change as well. Interesting. Okay. That's, that, that's helpful. Um, on the subject of breaks, I mean, a, a number of people have asked about uh, the idea of a 10 or 15 minute break and, you know, t taking homework and breaking it in, into to smaller pieces seems to be one of your recommendations. And one of the problems that many people mention is that their child is just overwhelmed by the total mass of homework. Mm -hmm. So do you, can you clarify some more how to break up one, a night's assignments, and also, I guess, two questions. How do I break up the whole mass of assignments for a given moment, but also a long-term assignment, mm -hmm. which I think stymies many an ADHD Sure, kid. I could talk about all those things. Let me go back and, and actually talk about the issue with too much homework. Um, okay. You know, teachers actually underestimate homework completion time by about 50%. So, wow. Yes. So if, okay, let's say the teacher thinks she's giving, so in general, a student should have 10 minutes of homework per grade level. So a third grader should have about 30 minutes of homework, a sixth grader, 60 minutes, high school or about an hour and a half. But let's say you have a third grader and the teacher thinks she's giving in a half an hour of homework. Um, she might really be assigning an hour of homework. And to top it off, your child has ADHD and it takes them longer. So you've got to think that ha that intended half hour is now an hour and a half of homework. If this is happening in your home, you absolutely have to talk to the teacher. When I was a teacher, I'll never forget, um, in November here we had parent conferences, and I was really excited to meet with this one parent because I absolutely adored her daughter um, named Haley. And the mom came in, and she was so defensive right off the bat. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, what is going on? This is not going to go well. And um, she said, listen, if you don't stop it with the homework, I'm going to take my daughter out of your class. Wow. And I, was just, I was completely blindsided because I had no idea. Nobody else, I thought I was giving a reasonable amount of homework. Um, nobody had, other parents had complained of that. And um, turns out, fast forward, this girl was later diagnosed with ADHD. But had I known how much her parents were struggling with this homework load at home, even without a 504 and IEP, I would have made some accommodations. And I think oftentimes teachers have no idea what homework is like for our kids. And in my book, um, my book, Homework Made Simple, Tips, Tools, and Solutions for Stress-Free Homework, um, I have a section in that about working with the school because sometimes teachers really don't know. And I would first address it with the teacher. The question about breaks, if your student can tolerate breaks, I would make them as short as possible. Um, you can break up work by time or task. Time would be work on this for 20 minutes, take a break, and utilize the timer as much as possible. If you find that your child is, you know, taking, you say take a five-minute break and you walk back downstairs and they're playing Xbox 45 minutes later, that's when you also want to use a timer for breaks because it kind of takes the emotion out of the parent having to say your break is over now, um, which, you know, can kind of be, can kind of get emotional for kids. Right. Or you can, you can break up homework by task. As I mentioned earlier, finish the math, take a break, start the spelling, take a break, start the history. Um, what, what people are mentioning here is online is that the restart is, mm -hmm. is serious after each break. So, you know, struggling with the fact that they know their child needs a break, but then getting started all over again mm -hmm. is a big ordeal. Mm -hmm. So how do you minimize um, that what I restart would, problem? Yeah, if you're having a major restart problem, oftentimes kids feel really overwhelmed and very underprepared. Um, I often encourage parents to start back with something different and start back with something super easy. So if things like, you know, if your child excels in math, but writing is really hard and writing, um, you know, I mentioned in my practice, you know, a lot of our students are boys and they often need an educational coach and a writing tutor. It's very common for kids with ADHD to have difficulty organizing their thoughts, even though they can tell a great story. Always have your students start with the math because that puts them in a better mood and then move on to the writing a little bit later. Um, even using software like Dragon, Naturally Speaking, 
um, webs, things like that are, are really helpful, but you kind of want to lower that barrier to entry as much as possible after the break. You know, over and over again, we talk about folders and landing, you know, um, stations, and yet so many parents, and there are probably five uh, on our webinar, who say that they, their children just simply can't, don't turn in their homework, mm -hmm. are not able to turn it in, mm -hmm. and um, lose it, misplace it, somehow it matter, it just doesn't, here's another, here's one from Angie, my son completes his homework but does not turn in the work. The, the teachers have a turn-in spot. We have a turn-in spot, but he just forgets. Mm -hmm. So what are, you, what are your thoughts? <laughs> you know, One of our speakers talked about the homework genie, this genie that just appeared in ADHD households and ate the homework. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, my gosh. Yes, the genie has come to my house a few times, too. I, I completely get that. You know, it's really tough, um, especially as kids get older. It's a little bit easier in elementary school because usually kids have one homeroom teacher. But when they go to middle school and they have about seven different teachers and seven teachers have seven different expectations how homework is turned in, that's often where, you know, chaos ensues. So my first step would be to really talk to the teacher. Um, the idea, I, I can't stand it when teachers say, um, you just have to remember, this is the homework and it's been here all year. This is how we do things every day. You know what? I mean, we all have different things <laughs> that we do in life and we still forget them. <laughs> And right. it's just, we're working with kids with ADHD, and it's part of their disability. Um, I think, you know, little things can make a difference. If it's an elementary school child, like a checklist on the desk, um, it could be, you know, a gentle reminder from the teacher. It could be really anything that can re help the student remember. Um, I have kids that sometimes will wear a watch that vibrates, and it, it, but anything that can help the student do it or the teacher can remind the student because it could be if the child has just not been able to do it repetitively, it's not going to help by just keeping expecting the student to all of a sudden do it. He will right. need reminders from an adult. Okay. There are a couple of teachers who are asking, you know, what they can do to help with kids who have a hard time, especially with procrastination. So maybe we should turn to procrastination. Sure. Because I think it, 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 it is tied in with homework in that mm -hmm. a number of people say their children just can't get started or they have mm -hmm. to constantly berate them to get them to start. <laughs> and they keep delaying and avoiding mm -hmm. and starting mm -hmm. their homework is a big problem. You know, one of the things that teachers often say to me is that the child often has a hard time starting with writing. And... Um, for those students in the classroom, and this will work for parents too, you know, it's it's not good enough just to say, okay, everybody work on, write a paragraph about your weekend. You know your child with ADHD is going to be sitting there and just knows what he wants to say, but just can't get it out on paper. So often for those students, even for older kids, it's a good idea to say, well, tell me what you think you want the first sentence to be, and then write it down for the student. Mm -hmm. um, the teacher or the parent write it down, okay, well, oh, that's a great first sentence. How about the second sentence? And the child writes it down, or you write it down, and then say, okay, great. What do you think you want the third sentence to be? And at that point, the child is kind of on his way. So he can recopy what you wrote, um, which are his words, and then he can write the third sentence, or he can take the paper that you've written on, and then he can write the third sentence. But so often it's just getting started in the process that's hard for kids. And if we leave them to their own devices, they will just sit there and won't do right. much. Same works right. for a worksheet, you know. Um, what do you think the first one might be? How about the second one? Or for some kids, just do all the addition problems first. Um, for, you know, a lot of kids, I'll fold the sheet in half. And um, I'll have them, and I'll say, just do the top part. Tell me when you're done. Interesting. Okay. Um, here's a parent. This is just, I'm just reading these, these wonderful questions coming in. So she says, you know, she thinks her child's afraid to turn in the homework because it's a fear, it's an anxiety. And a number mm -hmm. of people are talking about how the homework, you know, their children become so anxious that they mm -hmm. feel that that's part of the issue of mm -hmm. sort of getting them to um, calm down and realize that they can do this work. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I have seen that. We had a student last year. It was really interesting, and he um, 
he had a tutor daily and he did the work and he just did not turn in it. He was just in such a fierce power struggle. Um, it mm. wasn't, there was anxiety as well, but he was in a real big power struggle with his parent. Um, however, some kids are very black and white thinkers and to them it's either an A or it's an F. And if they don't right. think that paper is perfect, they are just frozen and they're afraid to turn it in. And those kids are often helped by a good therapist who can work through some of those perfectionist tendencies. Right. I found you know, huge successes with students um, working with a therapist on um, being okay with a B or being okay with turning in something that's maybe mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. good enough. That's interesting. Yeah. That perfectionism is really deadly. Yeah. It sure um, is. Uh, on the procrastination issue, one person raises the question of homework on the weekend. She mm -hmm. says she has a ninth grade boy who waits until the very last minute on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And and here's an interesting thing. She says, isn't he a little old for me to be checking what he's doing? And that question that she raises is also echoed by other people who mm -hmm. say, you know, I feel like I'm doing too much. Mm -hmm. I feel like if I weren't there, he couldn't do anything. Am I enabling him? Mm -hmm. At what point... You know, how, how parents really struggle with how involved should they be and how do they know when to step back? Right. Um, you know, you, as little as possible, you should be involved. And I know that sounds terrible, but sometimes kids start to resent an over-involved parent or they come to mm -hmm. depend on the parent. I'm sorry, Susan, what grade did you say this student was in? This is a ninth grader, I think. A ninth grader. And so he waits until Sunday night to start weekend homework. Right. Right. Um, I tell you what I do. <laughs> I don't know if this is the right answer, but um, I have that issue at my house, and one of my kids, you know, will just kind of do it piecemeal throughout the weekend, and the other one will wait until um, eight or nine on Sunday night to even tell me he has anything. And so we have the rule in our house that on Friday um, you have to come home from school and start whatever the assignment is until you get your phone. And he's young; he's in sixth grade, so it's easy to confiscate the phone. And then on Saturday, he can't go anywhere until he finishes it. Wow. And That's I great. know that it sounds harsh, but um, because I fought this battle with him for a while, and I realized that he just needs so much more structure than my other child, who at this mm -hmm. stage could have done that, that that's what it takes. Otherwise, it's stressing out our whole entire family. Right. And, you know, it just ruins the weekend. Right, right. Um, so, so for a ninth grader, I think it's perfectly acceptable to say, you know, most kids have their assignments online. Show me what you have. Okay, great. And when you show me that you're done, you can have your phone back or you can go out with your friends or you can go to that movie, whatever. Okay. Yeah. I guess parents have to take different, you know, stances depending on the child. Here's someone who says, I've had to step back and, and let my child solve the problem herself. The only time I intervene is if I hear from the teachers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm sure it depends on the child, the age, the situation, um, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, I think that actually is a very good approach. And the reason is, is that I've seen a lot of kids um, through high school, you know, be unable to function independently, even a little bit, because their parent is so involved. And these are well-meaning, great, amazing parents. But we're just worried. We're worried about the future of our kids. And um, sometimes when they go off to college without that sense of independence, it backfires. And they're just, they come home. You know, they end right. up right. leaving school quickly. And, you know, I think if we as parents can think ahead and think, okay, what is it that we want our kids to be able to do by the time they leave high school. And if it is to plan ahead, then that's the only thing you try to help your child with. You don't worry about all of the other things. And I do mm -hmm. like that mom's approach, you know, to touch base with the teacher, wait till they hear the, from the teacher. Right. Um, and then for some kids, you know what, the parent, the more the parent pushes on the kid, the more the child is going to pull back. And that's when you kind right. of know you need an, another third party person to help out. A tutor, a therapist, or no one, whatever, whatever the situation. Yes. So, um, a couple of questions about about the transition to college. Is that something that you're used to working with? And I know it's a big, big issue for a lot of ADHD kids who, who we know are sort of developmentally young anyway. Mm -hmm. um, how, what what should parents be working on in the last few years of high school mm -hmm. to get their child ready for for college? 
You know, Pat Quinn, um, who's fantastic. She and really she, is. Yes. Yeah. And her website is advance, A-D-D-V-A-N-C-E dot com. Mm -hmm. uh, she has a lot of resources on her website. That's her specialty, not as much mine. And she's working, she's written a number of great books for parents of kids with ADHD and for kids themselves for getting ready to call it, for college. And I would recommend her books. Okay. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, I, I read one about... Um, <clears throat> coaching for college students. For those of you who are asking, it's Patricia Quinn, Q-U-I-N-N, -N, and um, we, she actually has done webinars for Attitude. You'll find them in our audio archives, but her website is Advance with two Ds, A-D-D-V-A-N-C-E, and she is terrific on any number of issues, women and ADHD, college students and ADHD both. So um, let me just see here. Um, before I forget this, Liz, a number of people I mean, Anne wanted, wanted to know, well, you mentioned the fidget toys at the mm -hmm. very beginning. Where can they buy those? That's a question that's... Sure. Kind of um, the, the website is called Tangle Creations, but you can get those on Amazon for a lower price, and they have all different types. What do you put in the search bar? For oh, fidget, um, fidget toy? Or? Yeah, it's called a Tangle Junior. That's the one okay. that I have on the on the slide, Tangle Junior. So I would, yes, you can order them directly from that website, and they're about half the price on Amazon, but okay. they're, they're fantastic tools. Um, sometimes kids will get those, you know, those rubber, like the lip strong bracelets or those types of things, yep. and they can fidget just as well with those. Okay, okay. Um, back to organization. Uh, paper organization, as you addressed right at the beginning of your presentation, it continues to be a big problem for a number of parents. And a couple of parents feel that their children are almost hoarders, that they mm -hmm. almost panic at the thought of giving up all these papers mm -hmm. um, and actually put them back in their backpack if they mm -hmm. try to take them out or do the clean sweep once a week. Mm -hmm. um, is there another issue around hoarding paper? an organizing paper that people should be aware of? It's probably rooted in anxiety, and it's likely that the child is just so mm -hmm. deathly afraid of the teacher calling for a paper and, this, and not having it. Right. They want to keep, hold on to everything. Um, you know, if you have a child like that and they really, really want to keep as much as possible in their binder and they can manage it okay, it's probably fine. But at some point, especially later in the school year, what you might want to do is get a shoe box or a box the same size and say, okay, all your extra papers that you absolutely definitely want to keep have to go in this box. And anything, and you can only use this box. So anything that's more than this box, that means that you've got to take something out of it and throw it away. And let them look through to see what they really, really don't need and toss those things. That's a great suggestion. So yes, you can keep it, but out of the backpack and over here, yeah, you know, keep it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the the online world, the fact, the idea of you know assignments being online has really complicated matters because it used to be we could put it in, in notebooks, but now sometimes in my experience, teachers have blogs. They put their home their assignments there. There are other places. Mm -hmm. How do how do you how do you help kids, especially in high school, manage? online assignments and manage, you know, how much time they're spending online. You know, this mm -hmm. is a real dilemma, I think, for many of us. Who, yeah, you know, you know. just like kids in the old days, five years ago, had a binder. Yeah. Now they have folders on their laptop. Right. They, do, they do need to have the same type of organization system for their computer. Otherwise, I mean, I've seen kids where their entire um, home screen is just documents of right you know it's crazy um so as much as possible if you don't feel like you're the right person to help your child like with those types of things then then bring in somebody else who can help help your child set up a system especially for older kids but that's a skill that isn't necessarily taught in school and teachers just assume kids know how to do that and they don't and they absolutely right. have to be able to do that for college okay um, yeah. on, now, on the flip side, I will say that some kids that have been perpetually disorganized with paper and paper flow, when their assignments are online and they can upload things to Google Docs, uh, Google Drive for their teachers, it actually helps a lot with organization. That so, is so true. So uh, three people have said that since their child went to iPads at school, but mm -hmm. they've had no more problems. You know, sometimes yeah. kids are just better 
with um, online than they are, especially you know, sort of digital natives, than they are with paper. So, they are. It, it's, yeah. it's a great yeah. blessing for kids with ADHD. Right. It really is. Um, okay. Um, this person writes, I would love that. I mean, about the iPad thing. Um, <laughs> What about planners? Lots of folks or kids or people are saying they can't get their child to bring home the assignments, write down the assignments, make sure that they have the assignments. Are planners still um, considered, you know, key? And how have they changed in an online world? I know my daughter uses her phone mm -hmm. to keep track of her assignments. She's in college. Mm -hmm. um, so she uses the notes function or an Excel file on her phone. I mean, her, her phone is literally attached to her body. So <laughs> you yeah. know, the idea of taking her phone away is literally how she keeps track of her homework. Sure, so, absolutely. And yeah. at that age, you don't want to be taking your child's phone away, no. that's for sure. <laughs> but here's the thing, you know, even just five years ago, still we can encourage kids to use their agenda, assignment notebook, whatever you want to call it. But these days... Mm -hmm. Kids, I find that they are just not willing to do it. And part of the reason is they'll say, you know, why should I write it down in my agenda book, in my assignment notebook, when it's it's on Blackboard or whatever. Right, like, exactly. Or online right. portals. Why should I write, you know, it's there. Why should I take the effort to write it down again? That doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to some degree they are right. Um, the right. problem is that not every teacher posts things religiously on the website. So what I found to work with many students, um, and this would be older students, is to have an app on their phone if they are allowed to use their phone in school. Um, my two favorite apps for, these are like uh, online agenda books, is one is called My, um, my, my Homework, one word, My Homework, and the other one is called I Studies with a Z Pro. They're about $1.99. And um, it's basically like your child's agenda book, but just on their phone. And what is really neat is that these two, and I looked at probably about 15 apps for this, these are the only two I found that have block scheduling. And so many kids mm. in high school have block scheduling. It doesn't really work for, you know, the other apps. But um, it's neat because kids can, you know, send themselves text reminders for long-term right. plans. They can set up tasks. Uh, so that works for the kids that will take the second to, you know, type in their homework. Sometimes kids will say, you know what, what works for me is at the, when I'm walking out of class, I go up to the board and I take a picture of it with my phone. Um, I take a picture oh, of the Oh, actually, and I, Michelle, someone named Michelle just posted that. She said this has saved her son. <laughs> he used to text his homework home. Now he takes a picture of the assignment with his phone, and that's just been key. So I guess when the phone works for you, mm -hmm. it's it's... It's a it's a plus. It does. Can you work. repeat the name of that second app? I think the first one is My Homework. Yes, it's and a couple of people I, mentioned that they use sure. it, but the second one is. Can you repeat that one? Yes, I Studies S T U D I E Z Z. Okay. Pro. I know Pro. it's a funny name. I know. Um, and then lastly, sometimes kids will use the voice feature on their phone, mm -hmm. and they'll mm -hmm. be walking out of the classroom and say Biology, page fifty-two, one through ten. So they have the and they just add that voice recording throughout the day with all their homework so they can listen to it when they get home. Now, That's for younger idea. kids, um, if you have the case where they're not bringing home the right assignment, I found that just having, like, a grocery bag at the foot of the desk and any time the student gets homework, just to put it in the bag is really helpful. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, our kids are not thinking, hmm, I wonder what I have for math. Oh, I guess I should bring my math book home. Right. They're just ready to get out of the classroom. They're not really thinking ahead. But if they have everything already stuffed in that grocery bag, they just throw it under their backpack, and often that saves kids. Um, I have some kids I, we've worked with that just take everything home, and that works too. Right, right. Lots and lots and lots of questions. Um, how can I help them understand the importance of working hard? <laughs> um, you know, I think there are a lot of questions related to motivation, which I'm mm -hmm. not sure is your bailiwick. I don't know mm -hmm. if you want to address that. Um, people say, you know, how can I get my child to love learning or be more enthusiastic about mm -hmm. learning or embrace That's a great study skills, <laughs> you know. It's funny because I do a lot of workshops at schools and that um, – the number one question I get is, how do I get my kid to care? And I think that's right. kind of what you're asking. Yeah. 
Um, it is so complicated. Actually, there's a lot of research on it, and it's it's not it's not easy. Um, we know that that there are a lot of factors, um, and one of them is called this thing called grit, and it's basically having the wherewithal to pick yourself up after things get difficult for right. you and to keep on going. That's what many times our kids struggle with. Yep. Um, there's a great book called by Carol Dweck, and it's called Mindset. She's out of Stanford. And she's done a lot of work in this field. And the one thing we do know that absolutely works is that um, parents really need to be praising their child for any effort they put into work. So, for example, if your child never studies, um, and, you, oh, my gosh, you see him sitting down and studying for five minutes, lavish on the praise. You know, wow, that's awesome. You're really working hard. I can tell that you really, um, you know, want to get a good grade on that math test. That's awesome that you're sitting down and working on this. Um, but you don't want to praise at all for intelligence. So as much as we can make the feedback we give to kids about the process, about actually mm -hmm. doing some of the work, and less about, oh, that's awesome, you got an A, you're really smart. We know that that type of praise actually is a demotivator. Right. So as much as possible, praise effort. That makes sense. I mean, I think that's true in everything. It's just I think it's hard for some parents. There's a parent here who says, you know, how can I encourage my son to embrace his uniqueness and tools without burden, I, burdening him? I, I feel bad about always pointing out the distractions, mm -hmm. the sloppiness. Mm -hmm. And he's getting to the point where he doesn't want my help because mm -hmm. he feels, yeah. I guess, he feels that he's always being criticized. You know, um, the studies that's showing of the feedback kids get in school, kids with ADHD from teachers, 80% is negative and 20% is mm. positive. So as parents, we kind of as much as possible, even though sometimes it is so hard, we want to try to flip that equation so that at home we're giving about 80% positive feedback, which wow. is incredibly difficult. I know it's incredibly difficult, but, you know, let the little things go and, again, Whenever you see something good, try to praise that. Um, try to be invested in whatever your child does that is unique to him, even if it's not of interest to you. Um, so, for example, your, your son loves cars. Um, ask him about the cars he's looking at in the magazine. Try to find out what your student is interested in and spend about 10 to 15 minutes a day talking to him about that or her about that even if it's video games and you don't really like video games. Or yes. Japanese anime. Or anime. <laughs> yeah, you know, even right. questions like, oh, you know, tell me why you find that interesting. Why do you like that type of character? Engaging in that dialogue, it, it's, it turns the tables oftentimes. And okay. also, you know, sometimes kids get easily derailed during homework um, when we as parents are trying to help them and, they come to something that's really difficult, like maybe a math problem is difficult, and they'll say things like, oh, I'm so stupid, um, I just hate math. It's our first reaction to say, oh, honey, you're not stupid, you're actually really smart, and you're good at math. And we <laughs> and what you don't want to say is, actually, you know what, our whole family's bad at math. Don't worry about it, everyone's in the family. <laughs> just kidding. But, you know, oftentimes we we negate how our kids feel when they're in the moment and they're really struggling. And it's far more effective to say, you know what, you're right, this math is really hard. And right. just to empathize with them, those right. things go a long way. Okay. Okay. Well, this has been incredibly helpful, I think. Everybody would agree. I mean, I just think we all wish you could be our child's tutor. Um, before we close, is there, are there any final, um, I think that your final point about being more positive is just a terrific la closing piece of advice. Mm -hmm. But anything else um, I you want to add as we, as we close? Sure, sure. I just wanted to give some resources, resources to the parents. Uh, we, on my website, ectutoring.com, we actually have about uh, six different ebooks that parents can download for free. And one of them is on organization. One of them is on the three things you can do today to help homework tomorrow. Um, one is on um, the timeline for um, high school, ACT, and FBI. SATs. They're on all different things that relate to kids of different ages, and parents can find those at ectutoring.com slash ebooks. And okay. they're free. 
That's fabulous. And thank you so much for, for being here today and for everything that you, all your suggestions are super practical and I really appreciate it. Thanks thank everyone. You. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.